If you stumbled across a vintage Polaroid camera at a yard sale and happened to take some pictures of your friends, only to realize that it was a haunted camera with a ghost in it that comes and kills whoever you took a picture of, what could you do? In this video on Nerd Explains, I'll tell you how to beat the ghost in Polaroid. We'll follow the characters and see if they could have made better decisions, and ultimately try to figure out if we can beat the Polaroid monster. For some reason, a teenage girl and her friend decided to go through their deceased mom's old stuff in her creepy house with no lights on. They find her mom's old Polaroid camera and decide to snap a risque picture for a boy. One of a kind, something only he'll have a copy of. He can take a picture of the Polaroid though, just saying. The friend has to jet and the girl decides to stay in the creepy dark house at night by herself. What high school girl would do that? I'd have left the house with my friend and come back the next morning. After admiring her own model shot, she heads downstairs to find that Linda left the front door open. How inconsiderate. But then again, it's a creepy old house, so we might not be as alone as we think. Call me paranoid, but I think it's reasonable to get a little nervous if you find out the front door of your house is ajar at night. I came home once and my dog started barking in my dark bedroom. I went and got my gun and tactically cleared the room and closets using special forces tactics I saw on YouTube. You gotta slice the pie. Leave a comment if you know what I'm talking about. She then hears the Polaroid camera charge up upstairs and goes to check it out. I don't know much about Polaroid cameras, but I'm pretty sure they don't just charge up on their own randomly. To randomly and inappropriately use a banana sundae analogy, if the front door being open is the split banana, this is the three scoops of get the fuck out of the house ice cream. She finds the Polaroid of her model shot on the bed where she left it, except now that the picture's developed, we can see a silhouette of a person behind her. Maybe it was a shadow from a lamp or something, right guys? Guys? <laughs> Either way, this is gonna be the whipped cream. The electricity in the rackety ass house buzzes and flickers, shutting off all the lights in the house as if it wasn't dark enough. This is the fudge drizzle. Seriously though, at this point I'd be at the fucking window in that room. Whatever you do, please do not go wandering the house to check it out. <sighs> she goes to wander the house in order to see what's going on. Just FYI, if you find yourself wandering a dark, creepy, empty house asking, is anyone there? There's about a 95% chance you're about to die in the next 60 seconds. Her heart rate is probably jacked. She has to be feeling incredibly vulnerable as she steps on the creaking floorboards. She turns around to go downstairs and the ball that she tossed across the room in the beginning of the movie falls from the attic space and bounces over to her. This is the nuts sprinkled on the chocolate drizzle. This is like the fifth red flag. You should be sprinting out of the door, but not this girl. She goes to pick it up and scared shitless asks, Linda, is that you? Linda, this isn't funny. Before she climbs the ladder into the attic where the ball fell from. Can she make any more mistakes? I feel like I'm losing my mind at how stupid this girl is. Who on planet Earth would do what she is doing? The Grudge came out in 2004, instilling an unhealthy level of fear of addicts that should have prevented this. Once she makes it into the attic, the ladder randomly falls to the ground without her touching it. From the corner of the attic behind some plastic tarp, she distinctly hears the horrifying sound of something or someone wheezing. What does she do? She goes to check it out, of course. This teenage girl is seemingly impervious to fear and proper decision-making skills. This is the cherry on top of the sundae. And can you guess what's gonna happen to her once she pulls the tarp back? Yep, the wheezing Polaroid ghost monster grabs her and kills her. 
This girl did make a metric fuck ton of horrible decisions, but as we will come to find out, there really wasn't much she could have done. As usual, the first person to encounter the apocalypse, villain, monster, or whatever is probably Toast. They just don't know what they're dealing with. The monster has the element of surprise. Even if she did get away, she'd have most likely been killed later that night as the monster followed her. Flash over to a new protagonist named Bird, and she is getting her picture taken at school, thankfully not by a Polaroid. She works at an antique shop where the shopkeeper's nephew picked up an SX-70 vintage Polaroid camera from a yard sale. A yard sale from the house where the young girl was murdered. She takes his picture with it to test it out, but before the picture develops, he tries to kiss her. So she bolts, and when she gets home, she tries to take a picture of her dog with it. Her dog starts to freak out and whimper at the sight of the camera. Before she can snap the picture, her friend interrupts her. <sighs> Thought the dog was gonna get it. Later on, when she's going to a party, she pulls out the picture of her coworker. It's developed now, and there's a silhouette of a person behind him. This is the first time Bird sees something odd, but it could just be a smudge or old film. There's nothing that should really alarm us. Back at the antique shop, Tyler is still there, testing and pricing old shit. He pulls out the Kodak carousel, but instead of it being a time machine to a place he knew he was loved, it's an opening from hell that brings him death. Let's just travel the way a child travels. Round and around, and back home again. To a place where we know we are loved. Like our original protagonist, there was nothing that Tyler could have done to prevent his death. Sorry, Tyler. Meanwhile, at a costume party, Bird picks a card from a sexy fortune teller. It's a card of death. Her friends try to take a group picture with their iPhones, but Bird says, Wait, no, let me take it with my Polaroid camera. She snaps a picture of all four of her friends. As the flash goes off, she immediately notices a strikingly similar shadow to the one she saw in the Polaroid of Tyler. She checks out the developing picture, and despite the shadow in the camera flash, there's no shadowy figure in this picture. Avery shows up and takes a selfie with the same camera. Before the picture can fully develop, the police show up. They aren't there to break up the party though. At the police station, Bird finds out that Tyler was murdered that night. While she's grieving, she picks up the Polaroid that she took of Tyler. This time, the shadow in it is gone. Weird. She compares it to the picture of Avery and the group photo. There's no shadow in the group photo, but in Avery's, it clearly looks like the shape of a person. We know for a fact that nothing was standing behind her. Nothing should have cast that shadow. Before, it seemed like it could have been an issue with the camera or film that was causing weird marks. But Avery's picture is really hard to misconstrue as a random smudge. The shadow in Tyler's picture disappearing is odd as well. Dude, what is it with these dark ass houses? Does electricity cost a fortune there or something? And what is it with these teenagers that live in creepy old houses by themselves? Seriously, this is like a four story Victorian mansion. And where are the parents? Either way, Avery has about as much wits as the first girl. and gets her head torqued by the phantom. The morning after the party, Bird gets a call from her friend. She finds out that Avery is dead. They think she died after falling down the stairs by accident. Bird knows that something is very wrong, and these deaths might be connected to the shadowy figure that's appearing and disappearing in the Polaroids. She goes to check Avery's picture, but the creepy figure is gone. These pictures are all completely developed. Nothing should be changing in them. A mysterious shadowy figure moving between pictures is not normal. The thing appears in the group photo next. It seems to be killing in the order of the pictures taken, and after it finishes killing whoever's in that picture, it moves to whoever's in the next most recent picture. I mean sure, a haunted camera killing people seems dumb and far-fetched. But these deaths in the pictures are way too correlated for us to just pass it off as nothing. Especially considering that two of our friends were found dead on the same day. The day we got the camera. 
and they happen to have their picture taken by this camera. At this point, I would lock that camera up somewhere nobody else could find or use it and separate the camera from the film. I'd also put some tape over the lens. Numerous times in the movie, the friends just leave the camera on the table. It's magically charged up before, so what's to say it wouldn't take a picture by itself? If the camera was pointed at someone random, they'd be marked for death. Doing this wouldn't stop the monster or save their lives, but it would prevent any more people from getting killed. I wouldn't destroy the camera right away, because we did take a picture of our friends. They are still potentially in danger, and we don't know if destroying the camera would save them. I mean, the camera might hold the key to stopping whatever's going on. Well, despite what I just said, Bert throws the camera at the wall, hoping to break it, I guess. Some type of shockwave pulses out when the camera hits the wall. That's not normal at all. This camera ain't a normal camera, that's for sure. Considering what's been happening, I'd be tempted to take the camera to some scientists to study what the fuck is emitting a shockwave from it and how both people that had their picture taken died in the same day. Surely it'd be easy to prove that the camera was haunted. I mean, all you'd need to do to prove it is throw the camera against the wall again. Bird goes to school and her friend gives her the inside scoop on Avery's death. Apparently, they found her with her head completely turned backwards, exorcist style. Who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Damien! <laughs> Now I know the police don't have much to go off of here, which is why they ruled it as a possible accident, but heads can't physically turn around 180 degrees when falling down the stairs. A broken neck, sure, but not like the exorcist. I'm here to exorcise your bitch, man. Knowing what Bird knows, something killed her, and that something must be related to the Polaroids. Bird tells her friends her theory, how a shadowy figure was killing each person in the picture before moving to the next person in the next picture. Naturally, nobody believes her. Then, well, let's just say it's quite unmistakable that a supernatural entity is after them. They try to destroy the picture by lighting it on fire. The problem is that the Polaroid has some voodoo shit going on, and as the picture burns up, Everybody starts bursting into flames. Bird stamps out the burning picture and saves everyone. Then, like some Harry Potter shit, the picture magically repairs itself. Okay, so the first order of business is to ensure that the Polaroids are secure. If you drop it and somewhere down the road it gets damaged or destroyed, well, whoever's in that picture will get damaged and destroyed as well. Interestingly, the picture only repaired itself once the fire was put out. But if they didn't stamp the fire out, the whole picture could have been destroyed, along with everyone in it. Secondly, and obviously, no more pictures. We definitely know something is out to kill us, so what else could help us stop this thing? Both Tyler and Avery were killed when they were in dark, isolated areas. It's probably best to stay together and stay in well-lit public areas from now on. This will be a challenge as the lighting is fucking horrible in this town. It has supernatural abilities, so we cannot assume that any modern weapons or barriers could stop it. At this point, we really don't have enough information to stop this threat. Only some ways to not be immediately killed by it. We could destroy the camera, but again we don't know if it will stop the monster. We could be damning everyone who already had their picture taken. There is enough evidence of a supernatural force haunting the camera and causing the deaths of people whose picture is taken. We could easily go to the authorities with all the evidence at this point, which would launch a massive investigation of the situation. The camera, the history, people involved, and massive amounts of security for everyone whose picture was taken. I mean, all you'd need to do is light the picture on fire again and watch your arm magically burst into flames. That's an extreme example, but you get my point. Getting as many big brains looking at this situation as possible is your best bet at figuring out what this entity's weakness is. You could voluntarily take a picture of yourself, causing you to be the most immediate target. Then, with the might of the National Guard and FBI, set up a trap to test what weapons work. Better yet, the camera seems to scare animals. You could take a picture of an animal or find a terminally ill person who would volunteer to be the bait. 
Let's continue as if we decided to not involve the rest of the world. We'd probably want to find out as much as we can about the previous owners of the camera, or what circumstances led to this. A camera doesn't just become haunted and obtain supernatural powers for no reason. There has to be some significant, horrific event that occurred. We'd also want to start finding any information on the internet about haunted objects. Like, why do they become haunted, and how do you stop them? It's a good thing Bird and crew are thinking what I'm thinking, except that they split up and all went to dark, isolated areas. Bird and Connor go back to the antique shop to grab the camera bag. Maybe there's something else the camera came with that could help. Bird, thinking she's safe since she hasn't had her picture taken, goes into the store. She grabs the bag, but the thing is there stalking her. She sprints out of there, and when she gets back to the car, Connor points out that Bird is actually in the picture too, as a reflection in it, aka she's fucked like the rest of them. Well, it's clearly a real monster, not just a final destination force of nature. We can also confirm that it's not a person stalking them. This thing has a demented claw hand. Jesus, even the hospital's dark as fuck. And of course, this dude is going to go to the darkest, most isolated room in the dark hospital by himself while leaving Mina alone in her hospital room. Bro, this thing is killing people when they're at their most isolated, vulnerable position. Oh! You're just making yourself an easy target here. Devin eventually returns to Mina's hospital room to get jump scared by his dead girlfriend falling from the rafters with a cord around her neck. The police quickly chalk it up to a suicide. Excellent work, boys. Let's pack it up and go home. Mina's death could have been avoided if they stuck to well-lit public areas and stayed together. Yeah, she had bad burns on her arm, but there's much bigger problems at play. You know, like a killer ghost stalking them. Normal well-lit hospitals would typically be fine, but in this town, it's about as safe as a crack house. In the camera bag, they find a police tag marking this camera as evidence of a homicide crime scene. They go to the library to get more info on this crime from old newspapers. Apparently that's something libraries used to store. I didn't know that. They find out that an old photography teacher abducted, tortured, and murdered three kids while taking pictures of them. His name matched the initials on the camera. He was killed before taken into custody. The remaining three friends meet up at a diner and Bird drops some important photography knowledge on them. When you develop photos, heat and light can mess up the images. The monster might only be able to develop and physically appear in the world where it's dark and cold. Considering that all of the encounters with the entity so far have been in cold and dark areas, this seems accurate. At least it's the best defense that they've come up with so far. Right now, they just need to hang out in hot, well-lit areas until morning. Then stock up on oil lamps, torches, lighters, and flashlights before heading into dark, cold, abandoned schools to continue your investigation. I say torches because flashlights might be unreliable with the whole electrical disturbance thing, and they don't produce heat. As long as you all have a steady supply of torches, you can safely continue trying to figure out how to defeat it. Casey also brings up the idea that the camera could be cursed, and that it absorbed the energy of its owner because the owner has unfinished business. Devin freaks out due to Mina's death, and he and Connor tussle for the camera. In the heat of the moment, Connor accidentally snaps a photo of Devin. They check out the pictures, and the ghost moved from the group photo to Devin's Polaroid. He's next. This also confirms that the ghost prioritizes the most recent picture taken. Devin continues to freak out, threatening to use the camera against everyone else first. Casey, using the voodoo shit, stabs Devin's Polaroid with a pencil, causing Devin's hand to be stabbed in real life and the camera to be dropped. Devin gets taken to the police for hitting a police officer that was trying to intervene. While Devin gets arrested and jailed, Bird and Connor decide to take their story to the cops and they proceed to not believe anything. But wait, where the fuck is Casey? God damn it, guys, stop splitting up. 
Casey is now alone and vulnerable, but it's chill because Devin's the target for now. Unfortunately for Devin, and like we talked about earlier, barriers like a jail cell do not stop the ghost at all. Devin was an idiot for freaking out and punching a police officer. By now they knew that a ghost was killing them in dark, isolated, cold places. Punching a police officer is pretty much a straight drive to a jail cell, which is a dark, isolated, and cold area. It was pretty much a death sentence. As far as what he could have done to survive in that situation, well, anything to get out of the cell as soon as possible. I'd start hurting myself and beating my head against the wall. The police would have to put me on 24-7 monitoring or take me out of the cell. I'm gonna take a piss. The real big brain move would have been to hide my lighter in my underwear or ass if necessary. Package is secure. And once I was in the cell and the monster came for me, I'd pull it out and light my clothes on fire. Since the monster can't deal with heat and light, it'd prevent my execution. A fire would also set off the fire alarms, alerting nearby policemen and bringing the fire department. Hopefully, that would buy me enough time. Bird and Connor drive to Mrs. Sable's house. She tells them a story about how four kids teased their daughter, causing her to commit suicide. In revenge, her husband tortured and murdered them, taking pictures of their mutilated bodies with the Polaroid camera. During that lovely chat with Mrs. Sable, Connor notices that the ghost moved from Devin's picture back to the group photo. Well, Devin's dead. Okay, so he only killed three kids, but there were four kids. Bird and Connor break into the school to figure out who the fourth kid was, hopefully to get some answers. They find Casey. Seriously, where the fuck was she this whole time? They find out the name of the kid who wasn't killed. It was the cop. Connor, believing Mrs. Sable's sob story, takes a picture of the cop. Their hope is that by wrapping up the monster's unfinished business, they can end this thing before they all got killed. He gives them his side of the story, though. That Mr. Sable was an abusive father and took inappropriate pictures of his daughter. That they tried to help the daughter and get her away from him, and he killed them for it. Ooh, sorry for taking your picture. This is when the all-out brawl happens. The Polaroid ghost shows up at the school. They try shooting it, but this thing is like a T-1000 Terminator. Shoot him! Shoot him! Like the picture, unless the thing is fully destroyed, it will just repair itself, and it can shape its arm into a sword. Side theory, Bird is the leader of the resistance, and John Sable is actually a Terminator sent from the past to kill her. Sending Terminators back from the future is just too predictable at this point. The ghost grabs the cop's picture, and using the voodoo shit, rips the Polaroid of the cop in half, splitting him in two in real life. If they had gotten the torches and flashlights like I had mentioned earlier, they could have avoided the cop's death. Once the monster shows up, light the torches and shine the flashlights at it. This should dissolve the monster for now, and then recover the Polaroid and keep it safe. Bird and Casey make a run for the showers to turn up the heat. It stops the monster like Bird said it would. <laughs> Bird then, with her finishing move, takes a picture of the fully formed monster and uses the voodoo against it. She crumples up the picture of the monster, turning it into a pretzel. She then lights it on fire, and since the picture only repairs itself once the damage is stopped, letting the entire picture burn up into ashes causes the ghost to be completely incinerated, stopping it for good. We can see that the ghost is gone from all the other Polaroids too. I really thought the monster was going to have to kill itself, since it kills whoever had their picture taken, but nope. You have to take its picture and voodoo it. I think Bird got pretty lucky here. This strategy could have easily not worked. It definitely would have been on the list of things to try once we could ensure our safety with torches and lights, but it's not something I'd bank my life on. 
After incinerating the ghost, I would go visit a maximum security prison and take a picture of all the inmates, or just someone that deserves death. Then set an alert for any mentions of their death. Just in case we didn't kill the monster, we'd be able to get a little forewarning. Who would you take a picture of? Let me know in the comments. To recap, I think we could save some people and beat this entity. While the first girl, Tyler and Avery were all toast, the rest could have been saved if they made some better decisions. Even though it wasn't 100% clear it would work, staying in well-lit public areas and staying together is an incredibly obvious, reasonable, and effective strategy. You could argue for and against taking the camera to the authorities. On one hand, they could help you figure out what's going on and give you the resources to fight the monster. There would also be a lot of interesting technology that could come from it. On the other hand, the CIA would probably have gained a super weapon for their assassination program. I can see them mounting the Polaroid camera to a predator drone, taking pictures of people and letting the ghost kill them silently and for free. And with plausible deniability. What do you think? How would you beat the Polaroid ghost? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoy these how to beat videos, consider subscribing. And if you have a movie or monster you'd like me to talk about beating, let me know. Thanks for watching. And remember, don't take pictures of yourself with old Polaroid cameras.